if you look at Pakistan, for instance, uh, uh, 80% or more than 80% of the trade is still with the traditional trading partners in the West. So Pakistan is fair to say has not exploited its proximity as an advantage for doing trade within the region, which is cheaper. So the countries who have looked at borders as a trading post, they then incentivize and change rules accordingly. Pakistan, unfortunately, for years have looked at borders and still looking as security, you know, boundary. We have seen India-Pakistan trade with the press of button or closure of gate. Trade stops. When you look at it in that angle, then I'm afraid that trade does not take priority because people can't easily go. If you have a good location and you are not using it for whatever reason, I would argue that is location an advantage or are you yourself have become a landlocked country. Central Asia, when we look at the five countries, particularly Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, they are landlocked from both sides and they are desperately trying to open up their economies, most of them, you know, particularly Uzbekistan. Pakistan can offer a lot of services, food security, you know, uh, uh, some of the technology to these areas. These areas can give you, you know, the energy resources, they can give you other natural resources. This is the time that Pakistan should have a value proposition which they can offer to Saudis, which they can offer to Europeans, which they can offer to East Asians. East Asia is booming. That here is a market. Now, what is the strength of this market? The biggest strength is young people across the region. So there's a big market. Young people spend. The older you get, your spending goes down. Second market is that you have still a cheaper mid-level managerial and engineering base which can give a comparative advantage to the world. So we need to very carefully see what we are selling. For the past 50 years, if I pick up the papers, whenever there is a high level visit, you announce 10 billion trade or something like that. I have done it myself. But my question is perhaps the cost of these high level visits is much higher than the amount of investment which people have actually managed to materialize. Government investments should go in areas that can create economic opportunities for younger people. Because a country which is very young, so every policy should look at this filter. Second place that you need to invest in production and productivity. Because our imports will only go down if we produce more here. The third is that you need to look at exports and value-added exports. And fourth is that you need to look at uh, uh, emerging technologies uh, coming into Pakistan. Unless these filters are observed on a competitive ground, you cannot really, you know, stop the patronage which we are seeing for multiple years. Now the regional market actually, if it opens up, uh, it, Pakistan still is a functional market when we look at Central Asia or West Asia. And Pakistan has actually much better competence in private sector in areas like finance, you know, accounting, uh, textiles, uh, small scale engineering. So Pakistan should basically be confident and, you know, reaching out to these markets with our comparative advantage, agriculture. You know, these are the things which can benefit the regional market. Uh, we need to look at uh, products and services where fewer number of people actually exchange. And IT is one example. 
you know, it can cross borders without visas. Uh, trade of electricity is another example. You know, you connect markets, only electrons are moving people. So I think the confidence of having a lot of people coming, going and out will take time. But understanding each other market, if two countries start making money because of a value proposition, then the confidence will start building and you know other things will start falling. I don't see under the current situation, you know, opening up borders and people going freely. You know, uh, we have seen SARC, which is a miserable failure because, you know, people don't even get SARC visas. So we need to look at politics carefully and pick up things uh, which are less people uh, 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 movement linked, but still has huge volumes. And I look at global trade knowledge products are the biggest exports in the world. So why are my question, why are we hung up on only, you know, industrial exports? Knowledge exports need minimum number of people. It can be done virtually and it can earn you huge amount of foreign exchange. So I think the entry point could be uh, uh, products and services, mostly services, which are less people centric. You hear a lot of G to G these days, whereas it should be B to B actually. So I would actually, as uh, 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 markets don't grow on government to government. Markets, when you take market, that has to be private sector led. Let private sector take the lead. It is not the business of state to set the parameters of businesses. It is the private sector who has to do business. And Pakistan's private sector is reasonably vibrant when I look at West and Central Asia. And I think that's where private sector, but private sector has very little knowledge of these markets. And that's where public sector investment should go in, that they learn about these markets, that what their business practices are. People can't ignore half a billion consumers market if it opens up. But the question is, well, it could take 50 years, a messy transition. It could take 10 years with a fast track, smooth, structured transition. Uh, answer lies actually with our decision makers. Mm -hmm.